voice. Doing the post. Yeah, do I'll post. do it all in post. Do it live! We're doing it live! Do it live! Fuck Fuck it. It. We'll do it live! Do it live! Even We're though this is live. being recorded on Zoom. We'll do it live! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We are back for a special edition of the Choking Hazard podcast. And we have the crime fighter himself, Robert Ingram of the McDojo Life. This guy is protecting martial arts left, right, and center, making sure that nobody gets fucked over, especially in this weird time that we call life. That's for sure. But here we are, sir. Welcome back to the show. We have a special announcement for you today because like you just literally dropped it like about 30 minutes ago. So I'm going to leave the floor for you, but welcome back to the show. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, dude. Thank you for having me back. Like I reached out to you guys because I, uh, I really wanted to come back on and talk about the fact that I wrote a motherfucking book, son. Um, yeah. So it's called Sensei's Bars and Scars um, and is about my uh, childhood from the time I was 12 years old when I started martial arts until roughly about like 24, 25, I think. Um, and when I was young, um, I was just getting the living shit beat out of me in school pretty constantly. So I decided that uh, actually a friend of mine helped me up and, you know, he got me into martial arts and I've been doing it ever since. But from the time I was like 14 all the way until like 22, 23, um, I was actually fighting in these bars in Jacksonville nightclub called Plush. And my first fight, I was 15 years old and the guy I fought was 30. And I basically like lived my teenage weekends in this nightclub bar. And so I have all these great stories from seeing, well, this one isn't great. It's just a story. But <laughs> seeing my instructor set himself on fire in a, um, in a nightclub, um, which I sent you guys a video of. So that way you guys have like some evidence that that's true. Uh, I did uh, two on two fights uh, back in the day. It was called patron boxing. So they'd set a ring in a nightclub and then they would just look at a crowd of drunk people and go, hey, who wants to fight? And then people were like, I kind of want to fight. And they were like, get your ass up. Here. And then people would just fight. Um, so I got to do it because my instructor was the promoter. And I was like, I really want to fight. And he goes, all right, well, get your mom to sign a permission slip. So and my mom signed a permission <laughs> slip. And then I had to be the first fight of the night, most of the nights, uh, which eventually, you know, as I got older, changed, uh, mostly because he was kind of lazy and he didn't want to like tear down the ring by himself. So no one was staying to tear down the ring. So eventually he was like, all right, you can fight whenever you want, just, and you could stay all night, but you do have to help tear down the ring at the end of the night. And I was like, sold, sold. Me, me and Aaron had this idea for two on two jujitsu. So how did, how do these two on two fights work? So like, if you just knock the guy out, you could just like gang up on the next guy. Like, well, or you'd have to, or you're like, or is it like WWE where you're like holding the rope and you got to like tag yourself in? How, well, how did this work? <laughs> so it, they, they kind of allowed you to pick and choose the rules. I know that sounds wild, but as long <laughs> as like, both parties agreed, you could do it. So like uh, typically what would happen is uh, if it was a two on two, they even did three on threes and at one time did a four on four, which will let you know how absolutely insane this was. But they would let one team member from each side fight each other in a one-on-one. -on -one. Then those two guys would leave. I think they were two-minute, maybe three-minute rounds. Probably two. And then after that, the other two would get in. They'd have a one-on-one. -on -one. But then after that, two from each side would get on. So the entire team would be in there. So that's four fighters. And then they would have two referees. So that's six people in a boxing ring, right? And when they did three-on-threes, they'd have three referees. And then when they did four on fours, that four referees and this like boxing ring, which if you've ever been in a boxing ring with like more than five people, it's not that yeah, big. Yeah, it's not, it's not that big. Mm -hmm. The space runs out pretty quick. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, if your opponent got knocked out or quit, or if one of the people got knocked out or quit, they would look at the other, the other team and they'd be like, do you want to just fight this one guy? And they'd be like, always, they'd be like, of course, like we, we, both of us will just fight this one guy. So then they'd go over to the other corner and they'd be like, Hey man. So those two guys agreed that they would both fight you by yourself. Are you willing to do it? And then sometimes <laughs> the guy'd be like, all right, <laughs> like, <laughs> usually didn't last long. Um, but I, I even have a story in this book about a guy who did a three on three and both of his teammates got knocked out and it was just him. 
And they looked at him and they go, do you want to continue to fight? Expecting fully that this guy's going to be like, no. And he said, absolutely, I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it actually wound up being an, a, a literal riot that happened in the nightclub that night because that guy winds up biting one of the fighters oh, twice. <laughs> so it was it was a rowdy place, to say the least. Like Only in Jacksonville. Only in Jacksonville. Oh, that's good for sure. old Jacksonville. So, like, you almost kind of, like, the – as you kind of manifest these ideas, like this would be a great idea to have a two on two fight. But then like, when you actually like get into these, that well, maybe this isn't the best idea or like as a promoter, you're like, like, what are we doing here? Like, this has got to be nuts. Oh man. I, they even allowed something called Thunderdome rules, which is exactly. <laughs> what, so this is, this is a real term. We it sounds use. very like Mad Max. <laughs> it was, it was apocalyptic. You're fighting over gas. So the the two on two fight that I did, uh, me and a friend of mine, we went to go fight. We were like, let's do a two on two, and they were like, all right. So we signed up, and then these two college uh, age kids came up, and of course at the time I'm 16 years old, so these guys are in their 20s, I think, and then they wind up uh, signing up. But one dude's like pretty jacked, and the other guy just kind of looks like Friday Night Lights fat kind of guy, you know, like he's a linebacker or whatever that guy does. So. They, we wind up going, well, I'll fight the fat guy in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and then my other friend will fight the strong guy in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and then we'll do the two-on-two. -two. Me fully expecting I'm just going to out-cardio this fat guy. And then they agreed. And then out of nowhere, they were like, no, nah, we changed our mind. We want our big friend to fight the little guy first. I'm like, you assholes. And then my ego got the better of me, and I was like, all right, but the last round has to be Thunderdome rules, which meant that there was no time limit. And it didn't stop until somebody got knocked out or quit. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to probably beat him, but I knew I could probably just be tougher and stupider than him. And I proved myself right because he beat the shit out of me. <laughs> like the one-on-one -on -one fight, it was like Donkey Kong. He's just, he's throwing me against the ring, pounding on top of my head. Like I fall multiple times. It's just an ass whooping fiesta. And then when we got in there for the two-on-two, -two, he was just tired. And I was like, well, I can't really do much, but I can still kind of jab at you. It's not going to hurt. But I was like, I could do this all day. <laughs> so they, we wind up winning that fight because, like, the fat guy quit, basically, because he couldn't breathe. Okay. So let me ask you this. Because, I'm like, I think when we kind of speak and maybe the audience is like, yeah, these guys are trained. Or, like, are all these guys trained or is this just, like, random guys just picking fights and it literally looks like street fights happening in a ring. No, it was street fights. Like they, the <laughs> weird thing about like being there was they, when it, of course, when it first started, you get a couple guys who were like amateur boxers okay. who like, actually knew what they were doing. So they'd show up just to kind of be assholes and beat up some poor local um, who would just be like, I want to fight. And they'd stick him with that guy. Um, <laughs> we had a guy there who actually went pro and his name was Bobby Deluge. And Bobby Deluge winds up becoming a pro boxer. At the time, he was an amateur boxer, but he was also a bricklayer. So, like, he was a brick mason. So, he was, like, working with his hands all day. So, his yeah, hands were, uh, like, legit. Shown. Yeah. And so, he would fight guys. I think at the time, he maybe weighed a buck 35. And he'd fight guys who were, like, 210, 220 easy and just knock him out cold. Um, it, it, was, it was impressive to see because he's, like, this little guy. And he's moving so quickly. And then, bam, some big guy falls down audience goes crazy but most of the time it was just drunks who would just get into the ring and fight each other yeah like like I, like i still i still go back on the whole thing it's like these all sounds like great ideas and then it's just like what are we doing <laughs> like, yeah like eventually it got there like it was a big deal um i talk about this in the book a little bit as well but it actually changed for the nation the structure of how they actually allowed patron boxing to exist because during this time, they had something called the Tough Man Contest. And anyone my age knows about the Tough Man Contest, which basically was they would put cameras on amateurs, and then they would just put them on TV, and they did it like a tournament style. So they constantly had people who they didn't have to pay box mm -hmm. each other for our entertainment. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They technically called that patron boxing. Um, but then they were like, well, if they can do that, we could just set up rings in a bar. And they did. Um, and then eventually uh, someone at another nightclub died uh, because they were morons. And that ring, if you've ever put together an actual boxing ring, the slats in the boxing ring have bounced to them. 
Mm -hmm. So they give. So when you're moving around, you can hear the slats moving underneath you. Um, but that particular place decided that it'd be a genius idea to actually drill those in uh -oh. to the frame. So, so there's it was just no like give. Hard, nothing. There's no give. Nothing. It's basically like you're hitting concrete. <laughs> yeah. And somebody oh. uh, got knocked out without a headgear and hit their head on the corner uh. of the, the ring. Of course, it's all drilled in. And that person died. That was at another nightclub. And then I do believe, if I remember correctly, don't quote me on this, but someone died in the tough man contest as well. And if I remember correctly, I thought it was because the person had a heart attack. Um, so I know the person died in tough man. I just don't remember if it was a heart attack or not, but that's what I remember anyway. So it's just wild that all those things kind of came to a head where everybody's watching this, like, this is really dangerous, but entertaining. Someone's going to die. And then like two people died within two weeks of each other. Oh, and geez. then of course, the government steps in, they start changing regulations, and they're just like, you can't do that anymore. Um, but I, I got the idea to write the book after I started seeing all these viral videos of these like Russian fights overseas where they have like the three on threes and four yeah. on four. And I was like, that's just like what my life was as a teenager. I was like, there's nothing new. I was like, people are entertained by this shit. I was like, all right, I'll write a book about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's like they, what's happening in Russia now? You were doing twenty years ago. <laughs> yes, that's why. Uh, you know, I have a horrible memory, and <laughs> you know, you know, I, I remember my name. I I will admit, Russia comes out with some pretty cool stuff because they got like the telephone boxing, right? So like literally two guys at the telephone booth boxing, and then they had the jujitsu in the car where there's you start with the seatbelt and then they beat, the, they beat the shit out of each other in, in think, a car. I think for a, I think for a video, Aaron, we should do that. <laughs> just, I mean, we just start it. We just start in your high wail, on. Is wailing on? Wailing I mean, on each if other? you're going to like do something crazy, I think that those at least are fun. You know, like yeah. those are some stuff that I'd be like, I'd sign for that. Let's do it. You know, especially <laughs> car jitsu. Cause they're like using that seatbelt all kinds of ways. It's a, uh, it's kind of brutal. <laughs> Oh yeah. I remember watching one video and the guy like just put his hand over the other guy's seatbelt so he couldn't get out of his actual seat. And then he just started wailing on the guy. So he's trying to get out. Then he wraps the fucking uh, strap around the guy's neck, chokes him out. I'm like, oh, okay, that was actually pretty smart. Very samurai. It's like yeah, the guy you know. pulls the sword and he stops it. Like, damn, he's fooled me. He had a strategy. So so what would your strategy be in car jutsu then? I'm just going to open this up to the, well, open you know, up this I door always, here. I'm in Florida. So like, I always have a gun on me. So I'd probably just do that. Um, <laughs> seems like the, the easiest, the path, the least resistance there. Um, I don't know, man. It seems like car jitsu would give a lot of opportunity to be really creative. So like, I would have to find something in the car to use, you know, and like, I don't know in car jitsu if they have like the, the headrests that come out, but it'd be amazing uh, just to like take the headrest out and just use that, you know? That's actually not a bad idea. I didn't think about that. But my headrest comes out of my car, Aaron. You want to yeah. do it in there? We can do it in mine. Yeah. I think I think we'll, we'll set that'll be our next YouTube video. <laughs> show, show me the, the, the choking show hazard me. podcast. On the road. Car jujitsu jiu experiment. Just check yeah. to see if this works. You know, we'll, <laughs> we'll see if this works. We'll 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 shoot it by the time we do our next podcast in like you know four to six months. Well, Man. I mean, it'd be like a parody account of like McDojo life. So we just take all the things that like are bullshit and try them out to see if the shit works. So we've done that a ton. Um, I've had an opportunity to work with some really high level guys. Like uh, we were at ADCC um the last time it was in vegas the mm -hmm. big abcc and while we were out there um jocko was there and i got to chit chatting with jocko um which was very cool I'm, I'm very appreciative of mo uh i got to give mo a shout out for anybody who doesn't know mo's the guy who runs adcc but uh i didn't know mo was the guy who ran adcc mm -hmm. like i just thought he was a guy named mo i talked to often and then, like, out of nowhere, he's like, hey, man, you going to ADCC? I was like, I can't get tickets. They, like, sold out. He's like, I run it. I was like, really? <laughs> get the fuck out of here. So, like, I wind up going, and I wind up meeting Jocko there. And he was super personable, great dude. And he actually is now, because of that, an executive producer of the documentary we've been working on. Mm -hmm. And that meeting only happened because I just liked chit-chatting with Mo. Like, it was just so weird how it all worked out. But we did a video where we tried to show a uh tried to attempt a half Nelson escape 
or a full Nelson escape where someone gets you in a full Nelson and you're supposed to reach back, grab their head, twist it, and somehow they're supposed to let go. Hmm. Well, like, I don't know what anyone knows about Jocko, but Jocko was thick with some C's and some K's. He's yeah. a big boy, right? He's thick cut. So, like, I try to get him in a full Nelson and he just, like, stops it. Like, he just pulls his, puts his elbows down. I'm like, well, damn it. Like, it's never going to work for me anyway. So he gets me in a full Nelson and I'm trying to reach back and he's like submitting me with like this full Nelson. He's like neck cranking me with a full Nelson. And it's so painful. I just have to quit. Like yeah. there's nothing to do about that. Um, but it, it's fun to debunk that stuff with like guys who people respect mm -hmm. because then you're like, well, no one wants to listen to me. I'm a goofy looking dude, but you'll listen to this guy and then pull them in. Yeah, no, perfect. So I, that was actually going to be my next question. So like, what's kind of the status on the, uh, the documentary? Like, I know you were, we got, we saw a trailer a little while ago What about it. It's on the internet. People have seen it. So kind of like, where are we at as far as like the next steps with it? Well, I'll try to give you like an abridged start to finish. So like everybody knows that this little thing happened. I'm not sure if it affected anyone who's going to watch this or not, but it was called COVID. It was just a little thing, a little inconvenience. You know, it didn't ruin people's jobs and lives at all. It, it was a little nothing really. So, but uh, when we started to crowdfund, we announced every step of the way. So the day we had the idea, I made an announcement. I was like, hey, I think we're going to make a documentary. And then people were like, oh my God. And they're expecting it like in a week. I'm like, well, y'all suck. Because that's not how any of this shit works. Yeah. So, like, I we start crowdfunding, and it took about three months for us to figure out how we wanted to crowdfund. Because you get perks and tears and stuff like that. After that, we were like, when do we want to release that? And it was during a Conor McGregor fight, so that goes to tell you it's a while ago. So then, after we released it, uh, Indiegogo allows you ninety days to crowdfund. So we we crowdfunded for another ninety. Then after that, uh, we fell short of our goal. Uh, but then I asked the production company, and I was yeah. like. Do we like continue with this or do we just give the money back? And they were like, actually, we can make something with this. Let's just change the path. And rather than making a movie with it, make a sizzle reel with it and do a proof of concept. And then with what you have, we can probably get the rest of the funding. So like, all right, cool. We'll make a proof of concept. So we filmed for a month. Um, during that time, though, it was like three months until we were all able to film. So it's like production company had to be ready. I had to be ready right before we're supposed to film COVID hit. So then it's like two years until we can actually do anything. Because one, we didn't want to do a movie where everyone's wearing a mask. Yeah, no. And, you know, and then the other thing was a lot of martial arts schools were just closing left yeah. and right. So we were like, oh, shit. Like, is our industry just going to implode? Like, this would be the least important movie in the world of all martial <laughs> arts. Just like, quit, it's done. So <laughs> all right, well, let's just wait and see what happens. And we'll make a decision if, if it eases up. Because back then they told you it'd be two weeks for the curve to no, flatten the curve, I do believe, which is too bullshit. But anyway, so like two weeks go by, which turned into two months, which turned into two years. Finally, we filmed for a month. Put that together, made a sizzle reel, and gave it to a friend of ours named Jonathan Sadowski, who um he, I, I forget what he does. He he runs a website or a page on Instagram, but he's also an actor and uh, producer. So he loves MMA, but he's like also a famous actor producer. So he goes, don't settle to turn this into a film he goes take this i'm going to give it introduce you to a guy named adam wood who's an emmy award-winning director um he's won his emmy for uh editing actually which still is fucking, i don't have many emmys so like he introduced us and then somewhere along the line we got a guy um uh i i'm trying to remember his online persona crime sonic that dude's got like 12 emmys for sound for like shows on TV. Mm -hmm. And he contacts us at the same time uh, we get a hold of our new director. He's like, I want to do your sound. And we're like, we can't afford you. He's like, I'll do it for free because I absolutely love the idea. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. I was like, really? Like, all right, that's cool. So now we have like this good team. And then we wound up getting picked up by UTA, um, which is a big talent agency. And they are about as useful as a dick on my elbow because they do mm -hmm. literally nothing for us. Um, so UTA, pick up your fucking game, stop being useless. Um, and then we wind up getting Jocko on board about that time and all that. And now we're in contact with a company called the EO Foundation. And they want to come on board for the majority of the funding. 
The issue we've had with them, though, which is why we haven't pulled the trigger yet, is right off the bat, we got the feeling like they were going to basically get rid of two of our guys that have been on the team the whole time. And I was like, nope. So in order to stop that, I literally made those two guys, our director and our lawyer, uh, I made them part owners of the company, of, of McDojo Life Movie. So that way they could not be fired. I was like, all right, now we'll have a meeting because you can't fire them anymore, so let's talk. And then it was like they wanted a little more creative control than we were willing to give. And I was like, ah, like if I give you this creative control, what's even keeping me on my own movie? Yeah. Uh, and so we're in this like weird crossroads. And now it seems like they're willing to negotiate. But it's like if I sign this piece of paper, I'll make an ass load of money. That's just a fact. But will I make a movie that I'm trying to make? And that's a scary thing, especially me being green into that industry. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have a lawyer and I have actually two. But what my lawyers are telling me and what my gut is telling me and what they're telling me and what my team is telling me are not all the same things. Yeah. So in order to make a good decision, I basically just have to like trust my gut. Um, and I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. Like as of right now, I think that we can make something work with them. The problem is, is that we need it on paper. <laughs> like. We could talk. Talking's fine. But I need it to be written that I get final cut of my movie, period. And I need to make sure that the only cut that goes out is that cut. Because that's another little dirty trick that they like to do. Oh, you get final cut. And then the final cut that's released isn't yours. <laughs> like, yeah. that's how you get director's cuts. Mm -hmm. It's like, the director wanted this. Well, they gave him the finger and put out the movie they wanted anyway. Um, do, you, do you think that's a, bit, a major issue just with, like, anything creative is, like, once you get, like, studios involved and like it and politics and all that like is is this is this really the thing that just uh makes makes this really difficult and it's like a major hurdle it is like the problem is is that this is just my opinion being an outsider who's just now kind of discovering how hollywood works and from my opinion i'm used to martial arts that's the business i know I know it like the back of my hand. And yeah, you're not a, you're not a Hollywood director. You're, no, you're like right. I, I don't know that shit. You're I've never a, made a, a movie. fucking guy who likes to throw ninja stars. Once yeah, like I want like, to punch on. people in the faces and like do man shit, like blow something up. I don't like making a movie is fun and it's a cool outlet, but there's a purpose. Like that's why I want to do it. Hopefully, it helps this community. And when I'm looking at the way that they do things, there's a lot of like tongue in cheek. There's a lot of like, well, I'm gonna say this very politely to you. But what I really mean is this, kind of like that scene in Wolf of Wall Street where he goes and meets with a Swiss banker and they're being really polite to each other, but the, what they're thinking is like yeah. cussing each other out. Like, That's what it guy. feels like all the time. And I'm not like that. So like, I'll give you a story. So when we went to, when we went to go talk to Jocko, Jocko was like, hey, how's your movie doing? And we were like, well, honestly we don't have the funding to finish it and he's like why didn't you ask me and in my head i'm like oh bitch, i didn't know i could ask you for money like i just met you so can i <laughs> and he was like we'll have a meeting and then so we called we thought he was bluffing so then we had our guys contact his assistant and then we set up a meeting which is only like a week later we go there we have a two and a half a two and a half hour meeting which is great like we really had a blast just talking about fake martial arts and the goals of the film and what we're trying to do and then when it's done, my guys were like, well, let's just leave it there and let's get back with him. I'm like, fuck that. I was like, I'll just go ask him. Because like two and a half hours goes by and we never like came up with a deal or a plan. We just talked about the movie. So then I was, they walked away and I walked up to Jocko. I go, is this something that you want to do? And he goes, absolutely. Shook my hand. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Like, but the way it seems like it is in Hollywood, there's a lot of like, let's have this meeting that will lead to five other meetings and waste all of our time and waste a lot of money and effort to that will lead to a no. And that's not how I work. I go, yes or no, make a decision. Shit or get off the pot. It's not hard. Like, kind of like if you're about to date somebody, they already know if they are going to fuck you. They are well aware of this within probably an hour of meeting you. So why not just get down to brass tacks and find out? Like, is this going to work out? Did you have a good time? Like, why are you shy about this? You know, you're an adult. But Hollywood seems to be full of people who were just like sneaky little bitches, like that don't know how to be direct and be an adult. But like they're in charge of millions of dollars and your your intellectual properties and your livelihood. So 
I think that the standard is most people just sign away their life so they can get a quick buck while the studio will take your, your property, make whatever they feel like making with it, which is usually regurgitated bullshit that's already been out a million times before because that's guaranteed money for them. Mm -hmm. But what's strange to me is that it seems like every time Hollywood goes out on a limb and tries something new and different, that winds up blowing up and changing the status quo. Like Tyler Perry gave everyone the finger and said, I will have creative control of my projects. And he changed the entire industry because of that. But yet most studios don't want to give that up. They want creative control of your idea that they have no clue about. So it's, it's strange. Yeah. I think, well, I think that was one of the biggest reasons why they had the writer's strike and they had the actor's strike because they got about creative control. And then obviously the financials were the huge thing with AI and all sorts of other shit. But mm -hmm. the big thing was, yeah, the writers are writing so much and then that gets filtered down and well, it's not really your story. It's our story. And then they're changing it. And I know the writing world is completely different from the acting world, but that's generally the same idea. And it's strange to like work on a project. Like I've been in martial arts for 26 years, working on McDojo Life now for over a decade and working on the movie itself for almost four years, which is wild to think that almost half the time I've been working on McDojo Life, I've been working on this project. And the director like had no clue. He was kind of a fan of what I did, but like he didn't know all the little nuances of the lineages and the names and the art and all that. Mm -hmm. That dude could probably write a book right now about fake martial arts because of how much work and time and effort he's put into it because of the four years he's been on with the project if we got a new director like they wanted that guy's not going to have a fucking clue what yeah. this is really about and that's like the sad part and that's like the scary part is this person's worked really hard with me for us and then you just want me to cut him loose because you just feel like it like not a chance like i will never do that to any of my team members ever well, I think that's why a lot of directors, like, especially like, um, remember the Cocaine Cowboy series? I actually love that one. Well, love again, that. That, that's a, he had the bootleg that whole series because nobody, no studio would work with him because they always wanted to cut everything that he wanted to work with. So that was a big thing. It's like they personally were funded through his own money, own funnel, and they had to basically sell it through bootleg because that's how they, and now it's popular because like Netflix bought it. And then he was able to get more money for the, the most recent one. I think it was like Vice City or something like that. Um, mm. He has another series that he has as well. But again, fantastic documentary series. But again, getting stonewalled by the studios of not letting him do the project that he wanted to do. And I always thought that was like a myth. Like, I don't know why, but I just never believed that. I was like, that sounds ridiculous. They already want to buy what you have. Of course they want uh... your right name. Not a chance. Like, that is not how that shit works. They cannot wait to change your shit to fit some kind of a narrative. And you know what? Like, I, I will say this. Like, a part of our negotiation is that I am willing to go with a certain narrative if it actually already fits. So, like, for instance, like, I can't tell you what's in that contract. I wish I could right now because no, it's so no, I get it, I get it. fucking ridiculous. <laughs> but, like, let's say hypothetically, I think I can say that. Let's say hypothetically, I'm having a conversation with a company and that company decides, you know what, you should have this movie be about heroin addicts. And I go, which, by the way, that's not even close to what's in this contract. So whoever's listening from that company, suck a dick. But anyway, so like, let's say it's like heroin addicts. And I'm like, well, there's no heroin addicts in this movie. So that doesn't fit. And they're like, no, we had a deal. You got to put heroin addicts in there. I'm like, what? <laughs> fucking dumb now if they were like hey maybe we should do something about like cult psychology or maybe we should do something about like why are there more males who are leading cults than females that would be true like okay well those things actually may fit in there so we can research that and do something with it not like pull something out of your ass and go this is what the movie's about like what the fuck that is not <laughs> what this is about like where did you get that from that's stupid uh... but like you know, I think you're always trying to fight other people's agendas, especially the bigger a project gets. Everyone's going to have a little earpiece that's always going to be telling you what they think. And then after a while, you just have to basically just go with your gut. It's all you can really, do. And everybody you, wants oh, to put their own spin on your projects. <laughs> yeah, and I, if it's a good idea, like all my guys, they know me. Like even like back to the book, 
like my guy with the book, I told him, this is going to be 50, 50, like you will make half of what this book makes and we will do it half together. And whatever the result is, you'll make half. And that's how I've done every project I've ever done with the movie. Everybody makes an equal portion like of our core group, you will make an equal portion of what it sells for, even though it's my IP. And even though I have my name slapped all over it, and even though most of their reputations won't get ruined if a shitty movie comes out, except for mine, um, like that's to me fair. It makes a better project. Everyone has an equal amount to win, but everyone has an equal amount to lose. So if they half-ass it, well, guess what? You're only screwing yourself. You're getting an equal pay here. So why would you do that? And no one ever does. Like doing it that way for me has always worked out. Everyone makes a good portion and everyone works hard for it. Well, it's it's like any good business, right? Like if you have business partners that have equal portions of the business, they want the business to succeed. Again, it's, they all work together towards that project. But again, a, a studio is not going to have that same interest. They, they have flops all the time. So it's like, ah, they throw shit on the wall. It's stuck. Awesome. We made our money. Uh, it didn't work out the way. And again, who, who plays for it? You guys, right? Yeah, and I can't even separate the two. Like at this point, it is impossible. I thought every possible way I could do it. I was like, well, what if? I'm like, this has nothing to do with McDojo life. And then I was like, well, we did crowdfund originally. So if it's mm. not the movie we told them we were going to make, like technically that constitutes fraud. So I'd still have to deal with that. Like, it, it's just like, there's, it's impossible to separate the two. So people keep asking what, you know, why it's been so long, which is a very fair question. One, it you don't just get people to give you money. That shit doesn't exist unless you get lucky. Um, especially the type of money that we need because the budget's like 700 and something thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so in order for me to like fly to Indonesia and confront an Indonesian cult, that costs money. <laughs> like, yeah, they were like, why don't you just, the, my comments are the best. Oh, they're so funny. Like one dude was like, why don't you just take your cell phone and then you can just go to these like frauds. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take my bicycle because <laughs> obviously I can't pay for gas on this budget that you've given me. And I'm not going to eat. So obviously I can't eat on the budget you've given me. Then I'm going to take my cell phone and I'm going to get on a bicycle and somehow pedal my ass to Bali. And then when I get there, I'm supposed to film this with the shittiest audio you've ever heard. And then what about a guy to hold that? Does he get random people to hold the camera? So I'm going to get one dude who's going to hold the camera like this. And then I'm going to get another guy who's going to be perfect. Like, that's not how making movies works, jackass. <laughs> like, it blows my mind what people say. Yeah. Oh, no. Like, again, like, if you're, you're trying to build a quality product, right? And quality product, again, costs cash. Plain and simple. Mm. It's a... It's, it's kind of neat, though. Like, the process is cool to learn, even though, like, some of it's shady, but it's not something I ever thought I'd learn about. Mm -hmm. Never really had interest in learning about it. And then, like, out of nowhere, we start working on this. And then I was like, I actually really liked filming. Like, it was really fun. Um, what we filmed already was gold. And I was like, I kind of want to do more of this. So we actually wrote two scripts now. So now I'm just sitting on two scripts waiting for this to come out so I can actually do some, like, scripted work. Mm -hmm. um and then you know it's just fun to do i was like well fuck it i can do that that's fun it's awesome so as you've been obviously putting you have you're still working on this but now obviously you have to do more research you're obviously looking at new things like do you feel like it's the last time we spoke or there's like in so many different types of you know scams you've uncovered like do you think it's getting worse or we're just like finding more and it's always been around and huh I don't think it's worse. I just think like I have more free time to do it. <laughs> like, okay. like I, I haven't been able to do McDojo like full time, uh, at least for like roughly around the time we started thinking about the film. So it's been about four years now that I've been able to do McDojo like full time. Like that's all I do. That's how I make my money. And by not having to do a nine to five and by not having to live in a dojo anymore, one, I discovered food. Food is great. I don't know if you've ever had this substance that they call food, but holy shit. Like, uh, looking at like, Aaron, he's he's had a lot of that substance. <laughs> like when say. I was like teaching full time, I was like 155 pounds and I'm 6'1". I like looked horrible. <laughs> and then it's like I wasn't fighting, so I didn't need to keep that weight down. I just like wasn't eating and I was working too much. Um, and then I was like, oh, what's this is a fucking sandwich. What is this gold? And now I eat and I feel healthy. It's great. Um, and uh, 
now that I have that extra free time, though, I actually even made a website. I forgot. I wasn't even going to like talk about this, but we're going to drop it this week. So like we got into contact with a company called uh, Zen Planner who do CRM systems for martial oh. arts companies. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Zen Planner. And uh, funny enough, almost all of my deals I've ever done, I did over like a beer. <laughs> so like I went to the wrong after party at like a martial arts convention and it happened to be the Zen Planner after party. And when I got there, it was just people who worked at Zen Planner there. <laughs> like most people who walked in, walked right out. Excuse me, drinking my beer too right now. So like, I'm like, all right, well, fuck it. I'm having a good time. They got hors d'oeuvres. We'll sit here, have a drink and hang out with them. And we just got along. Like me and the whole group got along. Years later, I'm like, I want a registry for frauds in the industry. I want to make a martial arts registry for anyone who's done sexual related offenses, for anyone who's committed literal fraud, someone who's been to court for doing something nefarious mm -hmm. that I can prove. I want a, a registry for that. And they were like, we could do that. So we've been building that now for seven months. And technically, I could release it last week. I just chose not to because I wanted to put more content on there. Um, but right now, it is a very searchable list online now that people will be able to go, is my instructor done this? And then if the name pops up, you can click on it. And you'll be able to see all the things they've done nefarious if they have. Point on the doll to where Aaron touched you. <laughs> Wait, you know you know what though there's um i'm not sure if you heard of this guy i know me and aaron have been sharing this uh gentleman back and forth but apparently there's this guy is like the WikiLeaks of the bjj community is he has a a handle on instagram and on reddit it's a real professor eight nine three two something it's like something like that it's very He's very like low key and he's been like wiki leaking a lot of inside info from a lot of like major gyms. It could be like this guy's on steroids or that guy. It, and it goes even deeper to like this guy, maybe uh, touching minors inappropriately, if you know what I mean. And uh, I, how, how do you, uh, if you have like this information, like how do you, how do you get it out there? Is this a way to do it or like well, what are what are kind of like the the means besides like you know the website that you're making and well most things get sent to me um so people will send me things and go hey this person did a b and c and then my response to them is always do you have proof and then most people say no i don't and then i say have a nice day like uh, unless i have actual proof like i'll stick my neck out for anyone who could show me evidence um, and I got the restraining orders and the fucking uh, the cease and desist letters and the lawsuits to prove it. Like, um, but I'll stick my neck out for those people. But when it comes down to it, you have to be able to provide some kind of an evidence. And most people can't. And then I try to be that 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 middle person for them. Like, OK, well, who doesn't have, know this evidence? Well, this person knows, but they won't speak out. Well, I'll talk to them and then maybe I can get them to speak out. Um, I did a video the other day about a dad who completely lied about his martial arts record to a guy named Goob. And Goob does what I, was I gonna, do. I, I was going to ask you about that because like, <laughs> cause I've been following it and then I saw you pop up on it. I'm like, oh, fuck, he's on this now, too. This is awesome. So sorry well, to like, interrupt. There's but... only like maybe a handful of people that do what we do for a living. So it's like naturally we just gravitate towards each other. Mm -hmm. Like. And eventually we'll do a podcast together. We've talked about that. There's like a guy who does nothing but like actual fraud scams. Like uh, I forget what his name is, um, but he does John, one. John John Dorsey. Well, John Dorsey's goob, right? Goob. So and so basically he's like do, does what you do, but for like fitness trainers and just basically calls out all the bullshit on like people like in like uh photoshopping their instagrams and like oh i got results with this client but like hey dude like the door frame is curved like you should fix this photo. The, door, the door frames curved or it's like this person is like gotten results from like 17 oh, different trainers apparently it, yeah it, it's oh, and hilarious goob is funny because like when we talk we have different approaches completely to oh, what yeah. we do oh yeah so like <laughs> The way I do things is a lot different than the way he does things, but the way he does things is very blunt, brutal. Like John is a brutal man. And like his his lawyer emails that he showed me are fucking hilarious because his lawyer is just as savage. So it's like <laughs> you have like a savage lawyer, John himself, who has a law degree as well, by the way. 
And then he himself is also a savage and he's calling out these people who should be called out, to be honest. Like they're giving people these false sense of hope that they can look or be a certain way mm -hmm. while these people are selling their supplements or their programs completely mm -hmm. lying to you because they're photoshopping their bullshit photos. Like, look, right now I'm dad bought it the fuck out. Do you think I give two fucks about that? No, I don't. I don't care. But what's weird is like people in that industry, like even just a little bit of fat, they freak out. It's like, well, how about you just don't post a photo at all? Like you're an adult. You're making the decision to lie to people in public. And uh, I appreciate the fuck out of him for doing that. And he ran, like we talked to each other quite a bit. And then he sent me something across my desk, which was this guy online now is known as MMA Dad. And MMA dad, Goob, kept getting harassed by this man. So he reached out in very Goob fashion with just one sentence. Do you want to fight? <laughs> the, guy, <laughs> the guy was like, you don't want none of that. Like, I'm like a trained killer and like um, all these accolades. Like, I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt and all that, right? So then, like, he gave Goob, because Goob's not in the fight industry. He gave Goob, like, a blueprint of how to find out that he's full of shit. He's like, you can check out my tapology. You can check out my sheer dog. And so Goob goes, okay, looks it up. And the guy doesn't exist on there. So the beauty of it is, is that because I'm different than Goob, I was able to actually talk to the son and get the son in for an interview. And the son just spilled all the beans that this guy was full of shit. Like, cause the son <laughs> is getting all this heat. And I was like, look, man, you, you don't have to do an interview if you don't want to. Like, just so you understand, like, you seem like a cool kid. Your dad seems like a dick. I'm here for you if you need help. Like, you're legit. He does have a fight record, it, even though it's not like a positive fight record. He's still been in there. You know, he is actually trying to make a career while his dad is shitting all over it. And it's like, dude, like, I feel bad for the kid. But the kid hit me up like about a month in after saying, hey, I don't want to do an interview. And he was like, you know what? I think I will do an interview. And then the interview is just gold. It's very much like, uh, yes or no questions right off the bat for like rapid fire like 15 in a row it's like did your dad have a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt no did your dad ever fight not to my knowledge was your dad ever a wrestler i don't think so and like he, his dad the, the kid's not <laughs> shitting on the dad he's telling the truth and it, then eventually the kid's like you know what like my dad did get me into mma because his dad does love mma and then he like tries to like basically play the fence in the end he's like you know what my dad's still a good dad he just says stupid shit like <laughs> i'm i'm stepping out of this after that but if i could have posted the stuff that the ex-wife said whoo no oh way. my god like when people were like clear like people were going in the comment sections like oh well at least he was a good dad he made a good son i was like that's not how that shit works <laughs> i was like some people are good people but despite their parents not because of them and I was like, if you could see what his ex-wife wrote that she didn't allow me to post, it is bonkers how crazy this person is in real life. Like, he's a huge piece of shit. Um, so I had no problem roasting him online. How much heat have you gotten in your years of exposing all this fraud? And, like, how much how much smoke do you want at McDojo Life for? Oh, I want all the smoke. I want all the smoke. Oh, my God. Like, I don't think people get it, like, I'm a floating head, right? So I'm on screen. So like, I think people don't really get that I've been actually doing this. Like I was an instructor full time for a very long time in my life. You know, I have multiple black belts. I actually fought a lot all over the world. Like the, the I, I like this. I like confrontation. It's like kind of addicting. It's like fun, um, especially when somebody is dead to rights and the wrong. So now instead of me picking fights for the people who actually train who are good people and having to get in the ring and fight somebody who you might actually be buddies with if you weren't fighting each other, now I can pick out somebody and go, that guy's a fraudulent piece of shit. How about let's pick a fight with that guy? Um, but you get, you know, you get backlash. Like I have a, a demure set for tomorrow, which is like a, a summary judgment. And this guy is suing me for defamation. Because he says that I said he knowingly hired a registered sex offender. I never actually said that, which is what blows my mind. How someone can sue you for some shit you didn't say is bonkers to me. But like tomorrow, I get to find out whether or not the judge is going to let it go to court. And 
None of what this guy says is true, and I have evidence to prove that what he's actually suing me for is bullshit. Um, so I don't think it'll go to court, but we'll find out tomorrow. This is a crazy thing about the states for us uh, Canadians north of the border. It's like you can fucking sue somebody for fucking anything, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. The very first. So I I went to go interview him and he wasn't responding to any of my comments. And then finally, I was like, let me just make another stab at it. And I was like, I'll try again. I'm looking to speak with you about a gentleman named uh, Gary Snap Ferguson. Gary Snap Ferguson is a registered sex offender in the state of California. And Gary Snap Ferguson did some pretty horrendous things. So anyone can look that up. You can look up the videos on YouTube just to, to get a, a, a quicker version. So you don't have to look up all the crazy shit he did. But it's called uh, Offender and Enabler. That's what the video was called. I did two different parts of that. I did a part one and part two because the guy actually responded like a fucking idiot. Like <laughs> his response video was pure gold to me because it's just like him lying and getting caught in more lies. And then my response is just like, he says this. This is why it's a lie. Here's video evidence of him lying. Um, fucking bonkers. But the guy, Gary Snap Ferguson, wound up actually being at this guy, Brian Antax Martial Arts School, and he was there working around children and helping out the classes. Um, I have a text message between him and another person who was there, and that text message said, um, let me see if I can say it. I've repeated it multiple times. I don't know why I keep Gary around, which is the, the sex offender. Every time a parent finds out about Gary, they leave. Gary has costed me hundreds, no thousands of dollars, but I keep him around. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to read that, it would sound like maybe this guy did know that he was a registered sex. Just guessing based off of what he said in that message, you know? So um, it's just I can, I, Yeah, I could say being a martial arts school owner, if I have an employee that's costing me hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, there's a big fucking problem, and they probably shouldn't work for me anymore, regardless if they're a registered sex offender or not. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, like, and I'm pretty sure that Megan's Law probably would have forced the guy. So now it's like this interesting position, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, with the judge tomorrow, which is under Megan's Law, from what I can tell and from what my lawyer was able to look into, that the registered sex offender, because of the type of offense that he did do or, you know, he was convicted of, he would have had to have told his employer or where he was volunteering around children that he was a registered sex offender. So now I'm in this beautiful sweet spot where tomorrow when we talk to this judge, basically that guy who owned the martial arts studio, Brian Antak, who owns Antak's Kempo Karate. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but the guy who was suing me, his name is Brian Antak, and he runs a place called Antak's Kempo Karate. I don't, I'm just making sure that people can, are keeping up with that, but. Brian Antak, Antax Kempo Karate. But anyway, <laughs> so like that particular guy, um, he would have either had to have known, uh, one, he admitted to not doing a, a federal or local background check on an employee. So that's his fault. Um, or the second option, which was either he didn't do a background check, which he admitted to, or he did know. Um, those are the only two options of anything. You either know or don't know anything. So him suing me for saying that he either knew or didn't know is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. But it's hilarious because what this does is allows me to talk about it a fuckload and then go on beautiful podcasts such as this one. And then other people can look into it and you can learn for yourself and see what you think. But I'm not going to stop reporting the news because somebody decides to send me a cease and desist letter. Suck my nuts. Never stopping <laughs> to tell people the truth. Shit's never going to happen. Like, you're going to have to kill me. And good luck with that, because I'm in Florida, constitutional carry. So we could do it, but at the end of the day, like, I'm going to keep telling people the truth. Oh, man. The good old state of Florida. <laughs> yeah, I love Florida. We got Disneyland and Glocks everywhere. Just <laughs> So before we wrap up, I have we have two questions we got to get answered before we do. Why did your instructor light himself on fire? And then where can we pick up the book? Uh, now that it is finally released well i sent you guys the video of it so feel free if you guys want to edit it into the conversation oh i'm going to edit it into the conversation 100 percent. oh yeah so we were doing a fire demonstration at one of the fight nights actually one of the first fight nights here in town um at a place called club five 
And what would happen is my instructor would be there and he would referee and kind of like a thing that he was allowed to do to advertise his martial arts school is we would do martial arts demonstrations halfway through the night. And then we usually do like these black light nunchuck performances and stuff. And like we'd spend fire on nunchucks. Well, this time we wanted to do like a theme. So we did Devil Went Down to Georgia, the song. And so we played it out as if it was like a battle, a martial arts battle. And then in the song, they talk about pulling the, the golden fiddle out. And so for us, the golden fiddle was like nunchucks on fire, you know, because it's like these two people are playing fiddle against each other. So it's like one person does nunchucks and then the other, then the other. And then the other one's like, all right, well, screw you. Mine are on fire, bitch. And then he pulls them out. And when he does, it was the first time we had ever done this with a paint pan because we always did this outside. So we were like, well, how do we get this fluid into the, the building without being an issue? So we're like, well, let's put in a paint pan. Well, whoever filled the paint pan up filled it up too much. So as he goes to pull it out, like some of the fluid gets <laughs> on the ring. So okay. as he gets it, it on the ring, like one of my other instructors, his name's Mike, who's a huge douchebag, but he's fucking dead now. So who gives a shit? But he went to go like stomp out the fire. Like he was trying to help. Well, we talked about this earlier in the podcast, but like a regular ring has bounce to it. So as he goes to like stomp it out, basically, as soon as he does that, the pan lands on his foot. And in the video, it looks like he sweeps the pan. He really technically doesn't. It just looks that way. He actually was stomping and picking up his foot so he can like kind of sweep that little piece of fire out that got on the ring. Well, when he did this entire pan of Coleman's lantern fluid hits my instructor, all of it. Because if it didn't all hit him, it would have gotten pretty much that entire side of the ring. Oh, geez. Like when you watch the video, you can see him just go up. And Club 5 had really high ceilings. So he actually burned the ceiling. So like you can see he's like 15 foot flame. And while he's like looking to see where to go, like he's uh, he had told me he, that he had a surreal moment. He's like, am I on fire? Like, holy shit. I'm on fire. So he like starts wiping his face to try to see because the flames are in his face. And he sees like the table where we would set up the bell and where the paramedics would be. So he jumps over the top rope and he hits the table and he lands on the floor like right in front of me. I'm 14 years old. And this is like my mentor. Like this is somebody I look up to. And I'm like, I'm going to watch my fucking mentor die. And it's wild, man. Like I will never forget the smell of what a human body smells like being burned alive i'll never forget what it sounds like when someone's burned alive because that is a much different scream i promise you because when you inhale you're inhaling flame so like you're actually singeing you could burn yourself alive yeah. so like he's screaming but it's like this gargled like well i can't really inhale the scream so you kind of have to hold it back it's like not anything you've ever heard before and then some asshole behind us who was drunk of course had like some everclear or something like as they're trying to pat him out, throws it on him and sets his leg back on fire because whatever he was drinking was like heavy, heavy, heavy liquor and sets his leg back on fire. Well, he knew the paramedic, like the paramedics were buddies with him. So that paramedic turns around and fucking decks this random guy in the crowd. Wow. And the guy's like, oh, my God, like I'm so sorry. And he like apologized for getting punched in the face because he knew what he did was wrong. Oh, so they God. like they get him out finally. And they thought that he was like his words. He said he thought he was going to look like Freddy Krueger. And the doctors were like, you're going to lose your fingers, probably. Well, he's a martial artist. Like, you know, like, kind of, it's handy to have those. Um, and, of course, he's a nunchuck guy. He was really well known for nunchucks. So, like, without those, he can't be that guy anymore. So, like, he's laying in the hospital bed. And miraculously, uh, when he got out, you could not tell that he was in a fire at all. His wow. face was percent fine. He was able to keep all of his fingers and really he just had some skin grafts on the back of his thighs. But one of his saving graces, which is something most of us usually will heckle a little bit in martial arts, is he was wearing a hakama. Like if you've ever seen like Aikido guys, that traditional dress like pants they wear, that's a hakama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was wearing that just for the presentation of it all. And because he had that on, it probably saved his legs. Hmm. Interesting. Oh. Fucking wild, man. And I there's have a, a there's a that. use for a keto. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's useful for more than just a keto, my friends. It'll save you. So, if you're, so I actually have a photo of it in the book. That is my instructor on fire. Oh, in yeah. the, 
Um, and I sent you guys a video of that, and I'm sure you guys will play. I'm gonna, that I'm out. gonna, I'm gonna post it in in post production, and I'm gonna put it as you're talking about it. I'm gonna put it in the video if you're okay. But, with um, that. You know, like I'm, I'm very happy that he was able to live through that and able to continue. And you know, he had a family. He's got a wife, kids. Yeah, and all absolutely. Like, right. He was, a, he was like my first instructor, and I always will look up to him for the things that he did really, really well. And I learned a lot from him. Um, and so I'm grateful. I actually dedicated the book to him and my mom, <laughs> because if without either one of them, the book wouldn't exist. Um, so hopefully people will enjoy the book and you'll learn a lot about like how fucking dumb I was as a kid. And uh, you'll hear some wild stories. So where can we get the book? Where can people get the book? Is there a link that we can get or is it on a available on Amazon? It's available on Amazon, but I'll also send you a link if you guys want to add it to anything. But it's Absolutely. called Sensei's Bars and Scars. Sensei's Bars and Scars, which is what it's about. <laughs> like the picture. Of, this is actually, this scar right here under my, my eye is actually from a guy named Kuba who's fighting, well, I think, for the light uh, weight championship for the PFL. <laughs> Like, uh, we fought in a garage. That story's not in there. But there's another scar I have under my eye, and that story's in there. So there's a lot of stories of scars and my instructors and the bars that we fought in. So hopefully everybody enjoys it. But Sensei's Bars and Scars, you can catch it on Amazon. Paperback is available now, and the digital is available now. Um, hopefully everybody enjoys it. And if you buy it, leave a review. It only helps me out, and, you know, hopefully other people will enjoy it. Awesome. Hey, Rob, it's been an awesome pleasure having you back on the podcast. I do appreciate you coming back on, reaching out and getting us back into the groove of especially getting on our podcast where we've been slacking a little bit. So we're happy to get you back on. Um, all the best with the book. We're definitely going to pick up a copy. Uh, we'll definitely send up the links where everybody can get it. And hopefully that movie gets made soon. I'm really looking forward to that. Well, EO Foundation, I'm not going to say what those stand for. But EO Foundation, if they come through and allow us more creative control, at least give me final cut. If they give me final cut, we can move forward. Um, and then, you know, we'll be able to get it made. But they want to come on for a pretty substantial amount of money. So there'll be some give and take here. But we uh, we have faith that this will work out. And that is another thing besides my lawsuit thing I deal with tomorrow, besides the book literally just dropping today. So I'll be working on the book all day tomorrow. And I have to talk to EO to try to see if we can solidify this funding. If all of those things go well, I can stop drinking as heavily as I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> all right, my man. I wish you all the best, and we'll definitely be in touch, and I hope everything works out, especially tomorrow and obviously for the rest of the time. Yeah. Well, if not, you'll hear about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> all Thank the best, brother. All right, you. everybody. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you soon.